Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to another Friday evening. I'm not quite sure how we got to April already, but here we are. Welcome to the 2018-2019 Lectures in Catholic Experience, and uh, a special welcome to if there are some of you in, here tonight who have never been to St. Jerome's University, so welcome. We're glad you could be here. I want to begin the evening by acknowledging that we're gathering on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university is situated on the Haldeman Tract, and that land includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. We give thanks for the privilege to work and live on this land, and we're committed to building respectful relationships with Indigenous peoples and communities in order to enhance our own knowledge and learn how we can have an active role in reconciliation. My name is Christina Vanin, and I coordinate this lecture series. But before we get started, if you haven't done so, could I ask you to please check whatever telephone, smartphone, electronic device you have, and just put it on some kind of mode where it's not going to bother our recording of the evening. Thank you. So tonight's lecture in cultural history was established by the friends and family of Lawrence Cummings who was a professor of English here at St. Jerome's University from 1961 to 1971. And then when he moved to the University of Waterloo campus as a professor of English and architecture, he helped to found the cultural history program at the university's School of Architecture. In 1979, Professor Cummings received a province-wide award for excellence in teaching from the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations. As Professor Rick Holdenby, who is a past director of the School of Architecture, has said, Lawrence Cummings was the man who believed before anyone else that Waterloo could be one of the most original, scholarly, and creative schools on the continent. Larry Cummings made ideas live. He drew maps that turned into chaos, but still made the most extraordinary connections. His mark is still now and will always be on this school. To this day, the Bachelor of Architectural Studies retains culture as one of its four thematic groups of courses. And through those courses, students in the School of Architecture are exposed to works of history, philosophy, literature, and visual art, so that their creativity takes place against this broad humanistic and cultural history. And they are fortunate to spend, in their fourth year, uh, a semester in Rome, so that the relationship between culture and history becomes a real part of their school experience. So given the uniqueness and the significance of cultural history in this architectural program, we are indeed very fortunate to have Jana Levitt with us this evening. Ms. Levitt co-founded LG Architectural Partners in 1989. And she believes that architecture is an essential tool for creating, living, working, and learning in environments that improve the quality of people's lives. Her projects often involve implementing transformative cultural and environmental agendas that are developed through a collaborative process with diverse communities. She has led a number of LGA projects throughout Ontario, and some of those projects include Laurentian University's McEwen School of Architecture, the University of Waterloo School of Architecture, the Mabel Arts Park Pavilion, the Toronto Birth Centre, the Kiln Building Redevelopment at Evergreen Brickworks, and we're proud to say, the central location of the Kitchener Public Library. Ms. Levitt is an adjunct professor at the UW School of Architecture and also at Dalhousie University School of Architecture. So she lectures widely on architecture and the arts. She also works as an active jury member and panelist on architectural and urban design issues across the country. So please join me in welcoming Jana Levitt to speak to us on the topic, Determinism and Optimism, Architecture for Social Transformation. Ms. Levitt. Thanks very much for the introduction, and um, 
Thank you for inviting me to, for, to present at the uh, Lawrence Cummings Lecture, and thank you, Rick, for making this suggestion. Um, my uh, partner in life and business, uh, Dean Goodman, started the firm actually in 87, and then I joined in 1993. Um, we've grown quite a bit in the last uh, 27, 28 years, but I'd say the uh, the two constants that really um, are things that both Dean and I valued and we have continued to build on and re are reflected in the firm now are a kind of hive-like studio culture um, where everyone is able to contribute ideas and it's the ideas that matter, not uh, the seniority of the person offering them. And also the drive to expand the area of operations for architecture and um, architects in our um, civic culture. So um, there are a complex set of cultural, political, and economic forces that influence the way in which cities and buildings appear in our landscape. Um, that's the framework within which I'm going to present some of our work and is what the lecturer refers to as the ideologies of determinism and optimism. The architecture that we have worked on all these years and the clients that we love um, represent a rich diversity of cultures, environments, and social dynamics. The glue binding all of our work is the process. It's the thing, as you see the different projects tonight, the process in every one is quite similar. And that is um, where it's a process by which we dig into the complexities of any project. We believe they are both very vital and compelling and form a real part of the genesis of any piece of architecture or urban design. Um, and some of the things that I would say are form those forces are the client, the client goals, the community, the city, the environment, the funding method, the political climate. These are all the forces that shape a piece of architecture or an urban uh, proposal. The first one I want to talk about is a uh, house actually that Dean and I built for ourselves about 15 years ago when we started. Um, and you'll see this will be a constant throughout the lecture tonight is the um, identifying factors of the client, the goals that the client had, and then the forces that are to play that um, form the end building. Um, I, I'm starting with the house specifically because big or small, public, not-for-profit, pro um, these external and internal pressures are always at play, and it's how one navigates these and declares one's interest in these things that I think are part of what makes a successful piece of architecture. Um, in this case, what we wanted to talk about was the central theme, we believe, of the 21st century, which is climate change, and how that affects everything about how we live, we work, and the future of, of our communities and our country, really. And it's through this project that we were really able to start to answer, ask and answer some questions about how climate change will impact the way we think about architecture and impact the way we design architecture. And we were able to do that more freely in this project as a starting project because it was a house that we did for ourselves. And so as we were the client, the only constraint we had was budget. Um, and one of the interesting things that came out of this was a recalibration for us about what constituted beauty in architecture. Um, and I would say there's a, a pre-climate change idea about beauty and a post-climate change idea about beauty. And um, what we, as we worked through this, we thought, oh, there's really interesting opportunities here to identify another a kind of strategy about beauty. And in some ways, we called this a reciprocal ecology that came out of the dis, um, designing of this project. The things, uh, there were many things that we des designed and issues we addressed, but what I want to talk about here is the role of the urban site. Um, one of the things, John Strobe, who's a KW resident and a teacher at uh, UW School of Architecture, always talked about the thing you must do if you want to address sustainability and climate change is to build smaller, build smarter, build smaller. 
So um, what we chose as a hard point for building smaller was a middle class house before the Second World War, which was about 1,500 square feet as opposed to a middle-class house, which is now about 3,000 square feet. So our essential argument was we believe we can build a really great house um, at the scale of a pre-World War II size. Certainly nobody felt that they were living in anything other than a really great environment at 15, 1,600 square feet. So we really questioned, what are all those extra rooms? Why do you need them? And if building small is the entry level for uh, controlling resources and having a great cultural life, um, we think we, we're up for the challenge. So the, the site is a very typical site for Toronto. It's 20 feet wide by 130 feet um, deep. It's mid-block, so you can only get light from two directions. And what we really wanted to focus on was if you're building small in this kind of in, uh, environment, we wanted to really bring in the landscape and see how the landscape could help us, help us build a more beautiful existence and a more reciprocal ecology between building and site. So instead of thinking of a site as just a substrate that you put a house on, we thought, it, we thought let's design a house where the site is actually a very productive part. So it's capable of handling storms and droughts. It's also capable of tempering the indoor and the outdoor environment. And it also offers, in what our goal was, was to say, can we offer the same amenity and affinity of a bucolic landscape that people often talk about their cottage, about this kinship with landscape. We thought we can do that in the city and that would be a great thing because it, it would, um, ignite a kind of interest and affinity with the land in the city that we thought people didn't have and was necessary in the 21st century. Um, I just want to go back for a sec. Um, so a few things about the design of the house. This is a section of the house and you can see it's quite open. And what we did, tried to do was to work with passive ventilation, not active means, so we weren't using resources to design, to heat and cool the house. And um, you can see the open quality of the ground floor, a lot of east-west light all the way through. And in the section, you can see where the stair is, there's a big skylight above, so it allows light to get into the middle of the space. That means you're, day, you're harvesting daylight, so you're not turning on the lights for much of the day, 12 months a year. Um, this is my favorite drawing of the house up here, which is the roofscape. And what you can see there is that you don't know where the house is. And that's because one of the things we decided to do was to plant all the roofs. By doing that, we could design a house where you're always looking up and out into a landscape, no matter where you are, so that it mitigated what was a small footprint of a house at 1,500 square feet. It also then meant that, again, like you would at a cottage, wherever you look, you're connected to a landscape. And each one of the roofs has a different um, system technologically to, to do different things, so the top roof keeps heat out. The, um, and then it also has different depths. So this is the ground floor of the house, and you can see it's very open both sides. You can see the staircase up and the light down, so it comes down to the ground floor from the second floor. And um, it really just has a primary room at either end with a kitchen in the middle. Very simple. Um, this is the bedroom. It's a very small room. It's 10 by 10, but the way it's designed, the sill of the window is when you is at uh, eye level when you're lying in bed. Uh, we've been experimenting a lot since we built this roof. We were the first green roof, purpose-built green roof, so the technology was very um, limited when we first did it, but we've been experimenting since then. Uh, with different mounding techniques to increase the ecology, the complex ecology of the landscape outside the window, and also with edible plants. So at this point we have um, strawberries, onions, scallions, blueberries, and a number of um, root vegetables that are grown out here. And then uh, this is an image on the right of all the roofs, and again, each one of the roofs 
does different things. And then an image on the left of specifically the roof outside the garden, you can see the difference in the plants and the treatments. One of the things we did on the top roof is um, we experimented with six different kinds of technologies, green roof technologies, as a way so that um, when we were working with clients and they said, well, what's the difference between a trace system or this system or that system? We could talk to them very knowledgeably about that. And it was very interesting in terms of the house starting to become a laboratory for our experimentation as a studio. And what that also allowed was for us to get hooked into a, um, a community of in, um, landscape environmentalists at York University. And we worked with them on a number of different um, studies. So one is the top left is solitary bees in urban conditions. The bottom left is uh, clover in urban conditions. And then um, I'm also a, a kind of um, amateur beekeeper, so we have a couple of beehives on the roof. And it's been amazing to see, um, since the bees have gone on there, how much the roof has flourished in a way that is really not typical of the plants that um, are planted up there. And it's been really quite interesting to do. The next project is called Scatting Court. It's in downtown Toronto. Um, the client is Scatting Court Community Centre. And you can see, um, starting to have a bit more complexity about the forces that are at work there. The client um, goals were to create an accessible micro economy um, for his client base, and also to ensure um, some level of food security for his clients. And then there were um, a number of other agencies, in this case, um, the Toronto Public Library and the Toronto Western, uh, who are neighbors, who wanted to partner on this um, project. So Scanning Court, you can see on the left is uh, up in this corner, it's a community centre when, when it was built, turned its back onto that part of Dundas Street, which is this street along here. So the community centre, um, even though it was oriented to a major street, had no windows onto the street. Consequently, it was not a really safe or or didn't feel very safe to walk along that part of Dundas Street. To further complicate things, right beside the Scatting Court Community Centre, which is up in, in this little quadrant here, is the Alex Park um, Housing community here, which is Toronto Community Housing, so it's supportive housing, not-for-profit housing. And um, so Scanning Court is one of, there are several community centres in Toronto called AOX, and they have very special status with the city. They can uh, have a lot more autonomy over the programming they do, what they do with their site, what they do with their um, buildings, and the kinds of programming they can offer. At Scatting Court, the client had started, his client group is mostly Southeast Asian new immigrants and also the residents from Alex Park Community Housing. And he had started a program where you could, the residents and the community center clients could build culturally, uh, could cook culturally specific food and then sell it in the community center. And it was very successful and he wanted to increase the success and the ability of his clients to achieve some kind of um, economic boost. So in talking to him, we realized that there was uh, the ability um, along Dundas Street, sorry, along here to put some kind of temporary structure facing right onto the street that would allow him to get his, um, his clients somewhere really in a part of the city where the, they could increase their economic activities. And in addition, he started to think that this would be a really great way for if it was food related, um, it would be a great way for not only the community center clients, but also the Alex Park clients to meet on equal footing with a very rapidly gentrifying community um, all the way around Alex Park, um, where the houses you know, are going for over a million dollars for a very small property. So we worked with him to develop this idea. We realized that shipping containers 
We had seen shipping containers in other parts of the world used for something similar, but it had never been done in Toronto. We said it's never been done, but we think this would be suitable because you can argue that it's temporary um, and they're very inexpensive because you're not using them all the time. One of the critical components of getting this done was having the support of the politicians in the area. So in our case, it was Councillor Adam Vaughan. Um, if we had to rely on uh, the approvals process, we'd still have, we'd still be at City Hall trying to get approval. So we worked with him, we told him what we wanted to do, we said we can do it uh, very quickly, very, in a, very efficiently, and we can start to create some life on the street. And he said, okay, well, let's do it on a weekend. <laughs> So the whole thing was time that we could drop six containers on the site on the weekend. And he said, if, you, if I start getting calls or you start getting calls on Monday, just direct them towards my office. Um, so that's what we did. We dropped um, six containers off uh, on a weekend about seven years ago. Um, it was immediately really successful. So since then, the client has been adding more and more containers and now has a kind of small business uh, doing little container market activations at other uh, community housing sites in the city of Toronto. And what, one of the things that was really brilliant is that we worked with him to make a division between the two. One container is actually two vendors. And if you belong to the Alex Park community or you belong to Scatting Court community, you can rent, at that point, you could rent a half a container for $10 a month and sell your food. And it was, it's been enormously successful. He also, to create a lot of energy and a lot of interest from the start and to try and draw in the immediate gentrifying community, he reached out to vendors in the community, a coffee shop, an ice cream shop, uh, bicycle repair shop and said, if you want to come in and take over one of these containers, I'll give it to you for a very low price and all you have to do is be here seven days a week and you have to train one of our youth. And that was a really great opportunity to push forward the investment that he made. And again, I think the, the kind of social alignment with um, many of the small um, entrepreneurs in the area was perfect for what he was trying to do and it's actually been covered in many of the press all over the world. And these are the kinds of activities that go on now. Um, it's a kind of what's called tactical urbanism where you take a, a very specific idea and you just put it out into the community and you see what happens. The good thing about something like this is if it didn't work, it's can be removed in a couple of days. If it does work, you can build on it. In this case, it did work. Um, the next project is very different scales. The Toronto um, 100th branch for the Toronto Public Library System at um, Scarborough Civic Centre. Raymond Moriyama, a very famous Japanese-Canadian architect, completed the Scarborough Civic Centre, the white building up at the top, in 1973 when Scarborough was its own city and needed a city hall. He actually raised the site, so the site used to be flat all across this very large block and he actually raised the site where the Civic Centre was because he wanted to refer to the Scarborough Bluffs that are a really famous landscape element along Lake Ontario um, close to the site. A library in the Civic Green had always been planned for the site and Moriyama wanted to have that there. He realized that that was important, but it never got built. Um, the, the, the Toronto Public Library was waiting for the city to release the site, but it was only in 2008 that they actually did that and this, the library started the process going. So again, we have the Toronto Public Library as the client. And then we start getting even more influences and pressures, external uh, interest groups, um, all vying for influence on the way that the library would turn out. So it was everything from City of Toronto Urban Forestry. There were a couple of trees on the site that were very iconic and it were considered heritage trees. Immediately had to negotiate about keeping those, how, in what manner, could they be accessible to the public. Um, TTC, the never-ending story of transit in the City of Toronto, even then in 2008, they, the TTC was discussing wanting to have a stop there and so it took many months to 
work its way through that process with the library to realize that there was not going to be a TTC stop there not in the near future. Um, this was our initial sketch for the project, and you can see that um, our critical idea was that the, the Civic Centre was up on the hill in this inward-facing building, very beautiful and very um, iconic of a certain style and time of architecture, but it was not really relevant in 2000. Uh, and 2008 for a number of reasons, but we thought it's really a gem. It's a really, you know, we received a Governor General's Award, and so we thought part of our mandate has to be to revitalize that building and refresh the site by realizing Moriyama's dream of a civic green and a library on that lower plane to stitch the whole site together. And so this is just an idea we had of that the building, the library, would be like a landscape nestled into the base of the Civic Center that would add a human scale to the, this very large Civic block, that it would become walkable, which it wasn't now, and that it would become a textured experience, which it wasn't now. And those are all things that are really important as, as, as the city develops and becomes more mature. So part of our proposal um, was to update that urban design experience. Um, one of the key issues was in 1973, particularly in Scarborough, it was really a car culture. So the experience and the attention paid to a pedestrian was really not top of mind. Um, now, of course, in 2010, 2019, it's really the reverse. Um, transit is really the primary way that people move around a city. And with that, in this area, um, the neighborhood had changed from a very stable, lower middle class, white, single family, residential neighborhood to a high density, high needs neighborhood, generally, with some small pockets of single family houses. And there's a strong correlation between people with high needs, poor economic backgrounds and the use of transit. And that was really where the library wanted to focus. That's their main client group. So we advocated with the library and the, and the city to um, complete Moriyama's vision. That took quite a while because uh, it meant increased funding, increased time, increased negotiations, but we really felt that it was worth making that argument to make a successful library and to make a successful precinct. Um, and also the area, we did a lot of research and the area was really heavily documented as being underserviced in parks so we could start to bring in all the side um, information research to say that there needed to be more parks. And also um, the library, was in an area, without the civic green and a lot more landscape, there was a, a heat island effect, which no one had to worry about in 1973. So heat island effect is when you have a large amount or large expand, expanse of paved area, and with climate change, that gets, uh, absorbs and kicks off a lot of radiant heat. That means that the area around where you're walking is two to three to four degrees hotter. If you plant an area, if you put trees, if you have sprinkler systems, it immediately drops the area, which helps to make a more successful urban environment. We also wanted to um, break up the, the, um, that long walk along the, um, the street to the entrance to the library and the Civic Green seemed like a good uh, vehicle for doing that. And then we thought we would be able to organize the library in a way so that um, the roofs could all be planted, and that was one of the things that had been ignited by our work on our house. And we saw the benefit of that. We thought, well, maybe if we make the roofs all these sloped roofs, we can start to bring the Civic Green across the walkway and into the library. So our design for the library is basically an open floor plan. Um, the, everything, this was the first library where all of the furniture, even the, re, the um, reception desk and checkout desk are on wheels. 
And that was really a point of innovation that the library wanted to do but didn't know how to do it, and so we worked with them to do that. Because, again, in a high-needs neighborhood, um, people are underhoused. So if it's exam time, you can go into that library and it doesn't look like this at all except for the, the, the pods of, of columns because people are working in groups, collaborating, other people are doing studying for their exams on their own and there's pizza deliveries constantly. And then you go in there the next day and you know the librarians dutifully set it all up that night. They come the next day at about four o'clock, it looks completely different. So it's been incredibly successful. Libraries are great clients because they judge that as a measure of success when the place looks like bedlam at the end of the day. It means people really love and take ownership of the space and it feels really great. The use of wood is really important here because it's um, from a Climate change perspective, wood is a renewable resource. It's a carbon uh, sequestering material, which is extremely important when we have, um, when we're faced with climate change. And also, um, given that many people spend all day here, and a wide variety of people, wood is also a, a really good for acoustic treatment. And it also feels more residential, more domestic. We wanted a place where people really felt like they had ownership of the place. So we kept thinking about this as a kind of living room, and the columns are, are placed in, in kind of clumps that um, resemble like branches on a tree that you look up and out. And now, this picture was taken a couple of years ago. When you look out into all those clear stories now, you can see all the plantings coming up. So it's really quite, quite, um, quite special, actually. And this is a view of um, the kind of what we call the fifth band of the, the library roof. And this is the walkway that leads up to where in a couple of years you'll be able to actually walk up onto the roof of the, um, of the library. And right now, what you can see from here is the kinds of views that you would have from the Civic Center. So when you're up on the platform where the Civic Center is, you get to see a really beautiful green roof or a series of green roofs with the light glowing. Or if you're in one of the high-rise apartments that you can see in the distance, they get to see a really beautiful um, little jewel of a building set into a landscape. The next project, quite different again, um, is for Native Child and Family Services. They're a longtime client of ours. Um, this was probably our third project for them, but probably their most important one. Um, they're a urban indigenous service provider. They work um, with both with services and programs for indigenous youth and families. They also successfully advocated to have an indigenous children's aid society, which they were successful in doing. And so they manage that, the Native Child and Family Services manages that for the City of Toronto. So they needed a place where they could get, um, they were spread all over the downtown, they needed a place that they could consolidate all of their programs and also the Indigenous Children's Aid Services. And the challenge for us was to help them create a place where it was a bold and unapologetic announcement of an indigenous urban presence in the city of Toronto. There hadn't been one to date, and it was very top of mind for the client to say, we're here, we want to be successful, we want to be viewed as successful, and we want a place that people are going to want to come to. Not just our community, but where other kinds of communities will say, wow, that's an amazing building, that's, that's really interesting. I never thought about the indigenous culture having that kind of um, a presence in the city. So that was a really big challenge for us. So we had the, the client, and then in this case, a lot more friction forces at play to navigate and to learn from. Um, We started off, and this was as much our suggestion as it was uh, to meet the client's needs. Um, we started off by having an intense collaboration period um, where we didn't design anything, but we just started to, as a non-Indigenous 
architectural firm to start to understand what the issues were, what the forms were, what the practices were. Um, we paired up with Brian Porter, who's an Indigenous architect whose firm is Two Row Architects, and he helped us create a whole consultation session with elders, academics from um, Trent University, uh, different practitioners, um, and we worked with them to start to understand what were um, heritage indigenous form making and also what was specific for Eastern Canada because m many of the iconic images we think about as being indigenous are actually West Coast and, and not relevant. Um, and the, the client kept saying, I can't tell you what it is that will make me feel like this is our place, but I, I can tell you it needs to be uh, white pine. So he could talk about some materials and he could talk about some experiences and the same with elders. And so our job was to try and interpret that and come up with a coherent design that would, um, in a sense, tell a story of renewal. And the idea and telling stories became a kind of rallying cry for this project. We also worked with Richard, Dr. Richard Hill, and these images come from him, who's um, um, an artist and a curator. And he's done a lot of documentation of indigenous uh, material fabrication. And he was really excited because when we were doing this, he found actually a scrap of um, a floor mat in, from Eastern Ontario that actually proved that longhouses had finished floors. Until then, it had been, it was a story, but there was no Western proof of a floor mat until this surfaced. And so we used that as the basis for part of our design for one of the components I'll show you about in a minute. And then we just talked a lot about how do you layer things? How do you waterproof things? How would they have done it then? So the wigwam on the right, how would you have made that waterproof? Was that an issue? Why a circle? What's the relationship between circles and how people inhabit a room? And start to really think about that. So. A room like this only has one orientation, which is someone at the front talking to people in a very uh, unilateral method. In an indigenous um, conference room, you might have a circle and people all around, so there's no hierarchy suggested. So it was really uh, challenging for us to, to think about how do you make different shape rooms? How does that work? And again, to get back to the idea of what's beauty, it's very different when you're dealing with circular forms as opposed to orthogonal forms. And then we also did a lot of um, research into contemporary indigenous artists and their way to interpret their material culture in a contemporary language. And Ursula Johnson uh, is a great example. She just won the Sobeys Award a couple years ago. She's a Mi'kmaq uh, from the East Coast, uh, extremely articulate, really beautiful um, work. So we took a lot of uh, cues from her and from traditions of basket making, which is very uh, strong in the east coast of Canada and in Ontario. And so I'm just going to show you some images, pictures, and some drawings. This is the ground floor, um, the entry. There's two entries, one from college, one from Granville. And it was important even in this case, we really realized that in uh, in a non-Western indigenous worldview, uh, there's, it's like a story has no beginning, middle, and end. It has iterations and secular patterns. And so we wanted to, even in the way you approach the building, think about two front doors as opposed to a front door and a back door. Um, we worked with um, seventh generation, who are a youth arts group, and a graphic designer, Debbie Adams. And we got them to work out a pattern for the ground floor that goes from the sidewalk through the building and out into the street beyond. Um, it's, it's a kind of, um, it's a, a blanket stitch which from our understanding is actually quite common across the country. And then with Debbie and with this, um, the seventh gen group, we did a kind of uh, contemporary iteration of that. Um, the meeting room, sorry, here is like uh, referencing the longhouse. And then um, there's a welcome wall um, along one side that has, 
I believe it's something like 300 different languages across the country, and so this says welcome in every single one of the languages, and the size of the type re represents the amount of population that represents across the country. Um, it was really important also for the client, the connection between the earth and the sky. In a building that had three levels of parking below the ground floor, and the building took up the site, so how do you, how do you connect the earth and the sky in a building that it virtually has no site? Um, so what we did was we punched a hole through the middle of the building and put a pool at the bottom and a set of stairs leading up to the roof. Um, in talking to the elders, that seemed to work out well because in many of their teachings, many of their instructions to their community, it's, a, it's actually, um, it's so interesting because it's, you actually walk and teach. You don't sit and talk, you walk and teach. And so um, this became a way that could help them organize a route through the building or a series of routes through the building ending up at the roof. So you can see as you come in from College Street, you have um, the, the pool down at the base and the stair moving up. The this, this stair, the wall that forms the back of the stair was really interesting. When we were working with Brian Porter, he said, well, you know, a lot of Indigenous people, they'll just go to Lowe's or Home Depot and they just use whatever's around to make things. So we thought, okay, so we're going to use our, that as our cue and use materials that are pretty workaday and then elevate them through things like lighting or um, the planting. And then this is the entry to the longhouse that's up at the upper level. And that's an Easter pine, Eastern pine, white pine um, series of um, peeled logs that we use to finish the outside. And on the inside, um, it's you can see at the base is the reference to the mat that Richard Hill had found. One of the, the great things here was this is uh, traditionally with longhouses, it, architecturally it was using a reciprocal frame, which means you use the minimum amount of material to span, uh, to, make a, to make a volume. And so we, want, we thought that was really interesting and there's lots of examples of that. And this was the first project where we used uh, parametric design, so we used uh, digital modeling, both for the design of this room and to actually push that idea of reciprocal framing so it's the thinnest possible member, the fewest possible pieces of variance to create this room. And it was done, then the, uh, the whole fabrication was done in a shop. We tested it at a one-to-one -one scale and then brought it to the site to, to actually fin finalize it. And then this is set up in this case for um, a ceremony. And then the roof is really one of the most, I would say, in my one of my most favorite parts of the projects that uh, we've worked on. It's quite an extraordinary uh, space. We, um, it, it, the, so the roof is really like the fifth elevation. It's also a really hardworking program space for. Uh, the, for the native child. It's got a fire pit, it has um, teaching hills, it has play space, it has a, herb, um, a teaching garden, it has uh, the three sisters, so it has some agriculture. Um, there, there are spaces for informal assembly and for ceremonies, and then also places where, for the um, Indigenous Children's Aid, where there's family reunification. So there are some really intense moments that happen there. Um, we realized or we learned through this process that there's not very many places for urban indigenous people to connect with a culturally specific landscape. So even on the roof there was a lot of research and discussion about what's an indigenous culturally specific landscape and what does it mean and how do you do that in the middle of downtown Toronto. So it was an incredibly uh, amazing learning experience for all of us. And then even things like talking about the landscape and the landscape components as grandfathers, grandmothers, mothers, fathers, and what does that mean? And what, do you, what does it mean when you have um, a fire pit on a roof? Is that even legitimate as a ceremony? There were a lot of discussions about that in the, in the, um, through the course of the project. 
So this is a, actually a, a, a sweat lodge that was designed up on the roof. It was the source of much deliberation amongst the client and the client group because um, this is very unorthodox to have a sweat lodge on a roof as opposed to on a piece of land where you gather all the rocks and you bring them each time you have a, a sweat and there's a whole ceremony around it. And the client finally, like any really great client, as Rick will know, you have to lead. At a certain point, our client on this project said, no, I think for my client base, it may not be the convention, but it's important that we offer this ceremony and I'm just gonna make the call that this is what we're gonna do. So we then spent about a year and a half arguing with the, with the um, first the building officials at the City of Toronto and then the fire department at the City of Toronto who wanted, uh, who wanted to have fire exits in the sweat lodge, who wanted to have um, only um, a, a gas proof door onto the sweat lodge who just kept throwing up obstacle after obstacle and it really got really quite critical and we finally said at the end we just ran out of ideas we said look this is like a church are you going to tell this group that they can't build their church it, do you do that to other groups of people and that kind of locked it and that I, he just couldn't say no to that but it took quite a bit of advocating to get to that point um, in many of our projects, that's something that we need to do because they're uh, just like the Market 707. Many times you just have to keep going around the, the corner until you, <laughs> until you can cross the street. Um, and then the final project is the McEwen School of Architecture in Sudbury, which Rick was cr uh, seminal in bringing to life. Um, it's, it's located in downtown Sudbury and it's a kind of laboratory and a prototype for uh, sustainable design and what's happening in northern climates because of climate change. And it's a time also where there's unprecedented urbanization in northern cities due to the, the, um, the resources that are opening up even further north. So it's really a, a critical, critical point for um, for northern communities. So again, we have the client, the client goals, and then even a larger group of people to negotiate and um, issues to, to deal with. So we did a, uh, again, we did a series of consultations with uh, all the different user groups and people who had an interest in the project. Um, it's really Sudbury, Sudbury is referred to as a gateway to the north, um, and it, the Ring of Fire was very prominent when we were working on the project. It's less prominent now because they can't figure out a way to um, access the resources without um, spending a huge amount of money, so it may be a, a great win for all of us. Um, so we, but what we did is we analyzed both the schools of architecture, which are identified all below a certain line, um, and then we identified what were all the major economic drivers for the North, political drivers, environmental drivers, and brought that into, um, into the project and thought about ways that we could, you know, exploit that to the benefit of the school. And we developed a kind of bespoke, there are all kinds of sustainable metrics that you can use to validate the um, sustainability of a project. And we thought that doesn't really provide any relevance in a climate that has very particular issues. So we des developed our own sustainable manifesto. And in northern cities, one of the things we learned is that um, it takes on average two and a half days to get apart from the south. If something breaks down in the building, it can take two and a half days to get that part. And as we all know, with climate change, we're getting more and more power outages, more and more storms. And so the, the incidence of failure is getting higher and higher. So we decided one of the things, one of the critical things we had to do was to design the building so that even if nothing was working, you could still um, support human habitation for two and a half days. And that was one of the most, it's not visible, but it was really um, quite a radical thing to do. And then the other interesting aspect of the project was the tricultural 
overtly tricultural mandate. So it's going to be the first school of architecture that was English, French, and indigenous. And so again, just like with some of our other projects, we had to kind of put a stop on the works and say, so now we need to consult and find out what are the issues with the indigenous culture in this region and what do they want out of this? And how do we um, manifest some of those um, influences in the school? And so in, in the end, this talks about the seventh generation framework, which is an indigenous framework, which says any ideas about sustainability have to be viewed that it is as robust for the seventh generation as it is for ours. And that really um, creates a different way to think about the issues. And then, um, Rick, you might recognize this, some of um, uh, my former students and Rick's former students did um, Treaty Lands Global Stories. They talked about the curriculum from a non-Western perspective. And I love this diagram because it just shows on the left is what would be called a Western perspective where it's really one view, the big circle, and small influences nibbling around the edges. And uh, what they argued, and I would say, Laurentian McEwen School of Architecture starts to model is a very different approach where there isn't the one worldview, but many worldviews that are all um, moving and orbiting around each other, influencing each other, influencing each other. And I actually think that this is really the model that we need to think about to operate in with climate change and in the 21st century is recognizing the diversity of different views and how they can all work with each other and inform each other. Um, so these are just some images of the final project, the, the crit pit station really at the, at the point where the city of Sudbury can look in, come in, participate in, um, the, the series of shelves, so that's the big studio, all those shelves face south and so even in winter Sudbury has the most number of Sundays for a northern climate so even in winter you can get a lot of sun with the angle of those shelves the sun can come right into the topmost shelf. And then it also shows um, we worked with a new, what was then a new uh, material for Canada called CLT or cross laminate timber, which is a, again a really important and will become a more important material in Canada and it's a way to use um, sc almost scraps of wood and in, in some cases you can use what's called blue wood which is the wood that has been rendered ineffective as a structural member because of the um, climate change um, and the beetles that have um, destroyed the many stands of trees. With CLT you can take all that wood, chop it up and form it as in layers and it becomes a structural member again. And one of the nice things is it can be a finish, it can be structure, so you're not using more resources to build a building. What's the structure can become the housing for the building envelope, it can be the stairs, it can be partitions, so you're not adding layer and layer. Um, and then you can see the, the difference between, in this case we had, um, because it was a new material and a new, um, it had new fire rating and other building code things, we had a very, challenging set of negotiations with the city of Sudbury building department and they agreed to allow us to model it in one part of the school that was maximum two stories high and then when we wanted to go higher we had to use a different kind of um, s structural system. So one part of the building is the CLT and it's the more, it's the, um, the theater, the library, the sw smaller, more uh, domestic spaces and then the the studio is um, a, a kind of conventional steel and it's actually great for the students because in the course of a day you can walk around and instruct them on a whole lot of different systems um, just for through the walk and uh, that's the finished building along the main street in Sudbury and with that we're finished. I wanted to be an architect in another life. But, <laughs> so uh, Jenna's willing to take some uh, questions and open some conversation, yeah? Sure. Okay. Uh, rewinding to you, Jenna, was that a renovation or was that a 
designed and built from raw land. Yeah, that was a, a new, there was a, a, a little worker cottage that we tried to look at saving the foundations, but it was just not worth saving. Um, no, it's it's just layers of wood that are um, that are layered in this way and that way to make a diaphragm, and so it's not it's not plywood. It's, it's it, not no, no. Maybe I should be uh, an architect <laughs> in another life as well. Um, so these projects seem to have one focal organization um, are there other ones that have like a, a like a co-op like maybe 20 interested parties that want to all sort of amalgamate into one uh, one sort of building if you want to call it that or one construction these seem to have one overarching you know uh, uh, client as you would call them um, yeah I I'm trying to think about a, a project like what you're talking about can you give me an example of what you're thinking about well i'm just i'm just wondering is if everybody in this room wanted to get together and say hey let's let's build a a, a, a spot for a multitude of people from seniors to newborns and let's call it saint jeromeville Right. <laughs> right. And then now you would be getting the uh, the opinion of some 60 different right. interested parties as opposed to, you know, St. Jeromeville coming to you and saying, well, I think we'd like to do this. Well, I, I guess um, I, I'd say it, it always starts with a client. That client may be multi-headed. Um, and then what I, I guess I tried to um, illustrate was that the larger the project, the more the forces, the more the influences. So to make Jeromeville would be, you know, you coming, but you are a proxy for maybe 60 people. And then it would be broken up into groups like who wants to talk about it? the residential, who wants to talk about the academic, who wants to talk about the overall vision, who wants to talk about what are the goals for the landscape. And so you then um, break it down into uh, groups so that it's not only manageable, but that you have direct contact with each of the different, because what it, it seems like in my experience is that people have particular interests. Um, the the um, CEO of, a, of Native Child and Family Services would make the hard calls but in many ways, he delegated to different groups within his organization that was spread out over the city of Toronto um, to, to talk about things like, should there be a longhouse? Should there be, um, what, what in your opinion represents Eastern Indigenous culture? So they would come here or we would go there and then we sort of, um, work with them and then just the reporting structure was always up to the the CEO in that case I don't know if I answered your question but oh sorry Hi, I live in the suburbs of Waterloo, and I noticed that we never really talk to our neighbors in the winter. We never see them, and then we kind of socialize a bit in the summer. Um, how do you think houses should exist so that there's more community and more neighborliness? Well, I'd say put them closer together to start. <laughs> So you know what's what, what's going on. Not so your nosy neighbors, but that there's a sense of community. Um, you know, it's it's hard to imagine. You know, a house is so much about that negotiation between private and public, and you tend to do your public faces to the street. Um, and where I live in Little Italy, when I first started to live there, everyone hung out on the street. Um, you, you'd have, you know, the ladies come out and put 
seriously kitchen chairs in front so that their husbands could park at the end of the day in front of their house. I mean, they took over the whole street. It was a very different idea. In Chinatown, all the fronts were um, vegetable gardens, so they'd have you know all kinds of things growing there. It's it, and then it seemed like as the neighborhoods gentrified, different other ideas about what was acceptable behavior uh, started to take place. And so fronts became ornamental gardens. You didn't hang out there. You didn't sit in the front at all. It was always privatized. So what we tried to do in our house was make a front yard that actually people would stop and go, oh, that's really amazing, because we got tomatoes there, which was seemed so, you know, and then you could have a conversation with them. And it, there was more of a visual connection. Um, so now the house is old enough that people don't stop as much. But at the beginning, we sort of met all our neighbors because people go, did you plant your roof? Was that like a tree up there? And then you'd say, yeah, come on in. And you'd, you'd get, actually get to meet them. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. I'm just wondering about the, the critical time period ahead of you putting an electron to screen or whatever and actually starting to design something where you have many groups and many viewpoints coming in. Uh, how do you manage that? I mean, it could take forever, but it can't be too short either. Do you have a sense of when you are arrived at a point, or is this something you've gained experience with, how to manage that really critical point? It, it is critical, and um, it's one of the most difficult issues. And what typically happens is, and uh, Rick would know this from the School of Architecture, um, pressures like funding agreements um, really put hard stops to things. And so you uh, can you can talk a lot. And then, as in the case of the School of Architecture, we go to Rick, we'd say, you know, there's just no consensus on where the faculty offices should go. They Lots of people want them on the riverside, but other people want the students on the riverside, because that's the preferred view. And we, we've got to move forward, Rick. What do you want to do? And Rick would make that hard decision. And in my experience, that's a good leader, is the person who's willing to kind of go to the mat with what they feel is the best decision. And you model that every day. There's always that that period where, you know, and it, it's different. I think in the School of Architecture, it was probably two months. With the native child, it was probably five months, because the issues were so complex. And we had to go to Peterborough, to Quebec to really actually understand what was going on. And, and a good client allows you to have that time. But then on the other hand, they also say, OK, now I, my funders are starting to um, ask me, when is you know when's the ribbon cutting? And so you're always jockeying between those pressures. And depending on, like it, it, with our indigenous clients, um, it's a very different framework, like a temporal framework. But there's always external things like funding, no matter who our clients are, that tend to really impact that process. And, it, and it's, it's healthy, I think. You gotta test things physically through, you know, material um, propositions at a certain point. After the buildings open, this um, public library or the Native Child Center, how long does it take, or how long did it take the inhabitants to appropriate it? How, you know, did they change anything? Did they really love it the way right away? Because usually there's some kind of a period where people really get to learn the building and kind of make it their own, right? So I'm just kind of wondering from all those mm. studies and where you started, how they've lived through the first few years and what kind of lessons you might have learned in terms of how they use the building. Yeah, the, the, the libraries are interesting because um, usually by the time a library comes on board, people are, there's so much pent up desire for a library and people know, people at least, in, I would say the same, my experience at the, at the Kitchener Public Library, people feel like it's their living room. They feel like the libraries are there. So they, they're immediately 
comfortable and it's the librarians who are saying, okay, what do we do next? What do we do next? Let's change this up as much as anything in terms of making it their own or innovating it. The, um, Native child and Native child, it, it took a while, but also it was a big cultural shift because they had maybe seven different locations that were going to then co-locate. And so that's a kind of different ecology, and that takes a lot of time to adjust to. And so I think people were a little bit like, mm, I don't know if I can sit there. Is that part of my Indigenous children's aid, or now am I in, you know, seventh gen territory so there's those kinds of things to negotiate I think it really I think a lot of it again is is what's the how is it framed when you move in is it like is it your place can you can you can you change it like some in some buildings it's really you're not supposed to really change what's in there you can admire it you can like it but you can't move it or you can't say, I think it'd be better if it was green or something. So that's, well, I would say in my, in, in my experience, when people really love a place, that's when they say, you know, I think I'm going to make a little adjustment. You know, I want to make it work better for me. And that's, that's important. Yeah, I had a question about housing was the main focus. So you're building at Euclid? Yeah. Um, I guess there are three parts of it. I, I was thinking a lot about uh, that reduction in scale and size yeah. being a really important thing. And then the idea, too, of incorporating uh, recycled materials into building materials components. And then another aspect would be modular building, building things off-site, maybe one-to-one -one scale, like you were saying. They do this in the world. Uh, in Japan, I think Toyota actually builds modular homes indoors. You have to worry about weather. and mm -hmm. So it's just about efficiency and you know, just uh, reducing size and maybe the incorporation of materials to you know reduce landfill and also make uh, even stronger components and things like that. So it's just a general thing maybe you could... Modular, you know, we've looked into it quite a bit over the years. In fact, we're looking into it now with York University for a project. And um, the advantage with modular is that it can be done in a controlled environment. So you get perhaps uh, better consistency in the fabrication because you're not dealing with minus 20 degree weather and some guy, you know, whacking away with a hammer. But it's not any cheaper. So uh, it's not doesn't have that to commend, so doesn't help out certain people who would like to uh, build something. And it's, it's not really, you know, of course there's different opinions. I would argue that it's from a carbon perspective or it's not really any more efficient than um, building small and, and building, um, you know, intelligently with, with materials like you know, try and get everything within a hundred miles because you know, just anecdotally, that that's the least amount of travel distance, that kind of thing. And the building's small, I just think, and draw and stroke, um, as long as I've known them, um, keeps hammering that home. And I think it's really true. It's like, I would say, it's sort of like saying, you can have sure you can have an electric car, but if you're if you've got a Humvee electric car, that's not very sustainable barreling down the highway. You want a small car that's electric because that's the least amount of materials to, to use to construct it. It's the least amount of materials to maintain, and it's the least amount to get rid of at the end of its life. So just right out the gate. You know, and it's the one thing, because that's not a quick fix, and that's what we wanted to show with the house. It's not a building small. It's you're 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 screwing with a lot of people's taboos because people say that's not a good investment. You know, that you're building a, a little house, and we'd say it's not a little house, and actually, it's actually a very good investment. But you're challenging really fundamental precepts people have. Yeah. 
I love the philosophy behind sustainability and being able to uh, environmentally friendly and all that. My question is, you talked about um, end of life for that specific house or building. Um, I wish one day your building, all this work will be historic building so that people love so much to the point that they want to preserve in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering when, my real question is, when you build and plan, how long do you expect that specific building to last? Because in other <coughs> places in the world, some wooden building lasts more than thousands of years unless it was burned down by war. Right. Well, you hope that a building will last generations, really. I, I mean, we don't, you know, there's all kinds of conventional building warranties and things that are all about, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, but you, you hope that you build something that's gonna last for a long time. I mean, again, just from a resource perspective, it's a lot of energy, even if you build small, it's a lot of energy. You don't want it to, to go to waste. No, I, no, that's a good question. Yeah, no, it's a good question, and no, we don't. It's taken into consideration, like we want it to be durable and long-lasting, uh, but we don't say we want this to last 200 years or something like that. Are you using some special, like, high-technology membrane or something? Because I have this simple vision that if you started to get a leak and you have such a beautiful green roof, you know what happens and yeah actually uh, green roofs are uh, will uh, protect your roof from leaking significantly longer because you're not exposing the roof to uv at all so you get no uv deterioration the thing that would cause leaks in a roof are two things one is let's say i went out there with a spade and i forgot that there's a membrane two feet down and i want to get my carrots if i'm really vigorous and with the way I shovel up my carrots, I shouldn't use a shovel, I should use a little spade, I can puncture the membrane. So when you puncture the membrane, then it's, then it's an issue. So you have to remember that. Um, I don't think that's a big deal, but it is an issue. And then the other thing is, and we experimented on ourselves, and I'm glad because um, we, I, you know, I said it was one of the first purpose-built green roofs. So about five years after we were in the house, we realized that it didn't have the roof didn't have a root membrane, a roof a root barrier, and what you really realize is roots are very powerful, <laughs> and they can go like this and like this and like this and and through some membranes and under the parapet, and so we came this close to a really major failure because we didn't have a root barrier, and so we had to rebuild all our roofs, um, take away all of the planting, all of the. Um, soil, put down a root membrane, and it, yeah, root barrier. And in the end, it was okay because it was so early when we had done our roof that we didn't have very many options about how to build it, how to plant it. And five years in, the industry had exploded. It, it had been there forever in, in Europe, but not here. And so the industry exploded, so we were able to then um, do things we couldn't have done five years earlier. But it, um, to your point, it, that, that would have been catastrophic. But it, it, in general now, um, and it gets more refined, like you couldn't build a roof like ours now because you have to have a six inch gravel uh, perimeter. And that's again to help with things like keeping the roots even at the topmost level away from parapets. So there are, new things introduced all the time, but the technology is so, except in North America, it's been done a lot of places, and it just, there was a lag to bring the technology here. Now, I think because many municipalities like Toronto, I don't know about K, uh, KW, if you have a certain size, like if you're building a factory now, you have to plant the roof because of heat island effect. So that stimulates bringing that technology over. So things like, you know, even, I mean, another example is we have a high efficiency wood burning stove instead of a fireplace. That is so efficient with the way we've designed our house and with passive ventilation, we actually don't turn on the heat in the house very much and it, we can keep it warm with that. 
the building code won't allow you to use that as a primary source. I think at a certain point that'll that'll come that'll correct itself, but it's a longer lead time. So there's lots of examples like that. So, but what it does do is it makes you design houses differently. You have to design flat roofs that slope to drain as opposed to peaked roofs. That that kind of thing. So you have to. That's where you have to start thinking about what does my house look like okay, I can think about a house that looks like this because it's doing these other things. It's not just shedding roof like this as a very simple gesture. It's a roof that's actually a hardworking part of the, of the system of the house and of the, and of the landscape, actually. I'm going to invite up uh, Professor Rick Heldemey, who was director at the Waterloo School of Architecture from 1988 to 2013, to formally thank uh, Janet on our behalf. Thanks, Christina. And thank you, Jenna. Um, I, I must say that um, it, it makes me exceedingly proud of the architectural profession to listen to you, to listen to you expound uh, an approach to the design of buildings that um, depends on uh, listening, uh, that depends on thinking, that is not slave to uh, photography and uh, traditional aesthetics, but sees aesthetics not in a functionally deterministic way, but sees aesthetics in a discursive way as the outcome of a conversation that involves material, that involves people, that involves culture, that involves, as you showed in the diagram, a series of um, <laughs> orbiting clusters of, of thought that attributes to architecture a dignity and agency that in a way, it abandons when it considers only economic or only aesthetic or only formal devices. And I've always admired in your work and the work of your colleagues this extraordinary ability to go to the root of the question and to allow the roots of the question, the various roots of the question, uh, influence the outcome rather than some predetermined stylistic, formalistic, aesthetic vision. Um, I should own up, and it's been made clear over the course of the evening that uh, Jen and I have worked together for a long time. I've known her for many, many years. Um, uh, she's worked with <laughs> both principal members of my household. Uh, Jana is the architect of the School of Architecture. She's also the architect of the uh, Waterloo Region Children's Museum, which my wife is the founding director of. Um, I'm also a huge champion of uh, exactly the point that was most recently raised about around the issue of <laughs> preserving public buildings of value and virtue. And of course, seeing uh, Janice's extraordinary project that uh, took the bones and fabric of the Kitchener Public Library, Carl Reeder's wonderful late 1950s building, and then reinvigorated it, keeping the bones and, and organization and the mural and, and, and bringing it into a uh, making it relevant for a whole new generation of Kitchenerites and Waterloo Regionites. Um, I, so I feel really uh, remarkably uh, uh, privileged to have worked with her on so many projects directly. And um, also, of course, at the School of Architecture, where she's been teaching for many, many years now. And then also, as she alluded to McEwen School in Sudbury, which was sort of my project until it became her project. Um, that is to say, as an idea and an institution, I worked on it. And as a, an institution and a building, she worked on it. Um, there's so many connections that I just feel really, really um, lucky. Um, and, to have had her friendship and, and her collaboration in so many different ways. But beyond all other th 
things that I could say. I just so respect the integrity, the openness, the invention, the agency, and the commitment that she and her colleagues have shown and dedicated to every building that they've ever done. Thank you, Jenna. Thanks very much, Rick. So just a couple of uh, announcements and things before we finish up tonight. So we do send out regular emails about speakers um, and events. Um, so if you want to know what's going to be happening at St. Charles University in our next academic year, then please at the welcome table, um, feel free to let us know uh, your name and contact information and we'll make sure to let you, um, to inform you as the new year unfolds. Every year, St. Charles University is pleased to present speakers to the community and to make them available to you. Because, And we can do that because of the generosity of a lot of people. So if you too would like to uh, offer some support to tonight's lecture, then there are some donation envelopes at the table. Um, you would have seen perhaps on your way in that there are a number of uh, fairly traded products available for sale. So if you're looking for some things to stock up for Easter gifts and things, there's lots of great chocolate. Um, our local independent bookseller Wordsworth Books is also with us this evening, so you can visit their table. And lastly, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming this evening. Um, and probably more so because this is the last lecture in this year's series. So I want to say thank you very much. Uh, there are many of you who are regular, committed people that come to our lectures. So thank you for being that. And thank you for all the ways that you spread the word about um, St. Charles University and the, all the different kinds of lectures and events that we have. Stay tuned for information. Um, that's the next agenda item on my plate, among many things. But we'll be sending out information about our 2019-2020 lectures in Catholic experience towards the end of the summer into um, September. So I hope I'll see as many of you back here next year for the series. Hope you have a safe trip home. Um, have a wonderful Easter. And for tonight, good night. Take care.